in part one, we have seen that embryology in the Quran and the Sunnah fails part one of my The Three Truth Test, as we have good alternative explanations for the applicable ayat in the Quran, which means it does not constitute a miracle. Part two passed partially as the terms used are ambiguous and the terms required are missing. I will now continue with part three of my test, which is, does the description in the Quran correctly represent reality? As it stands, people have to perform brain acrobatics to arrive at interpretations of a word such as nutfa, ranging from mingled fluids or a mingled drop up to actually calling it a zygote, but skipping the essential elements and fertilization. After fertilization has taken place, the zygote divides to form more cells and travels down the fallopian tube to the uterus, in free suspension, and not clinging at all. If it were, miscarriage or an ectopic pregnancy would be the result. Now, a zygote actually develops into an embryo and then a fetus. If a god manually controlled this, I doubt we would have twins or, even worse, conjoined twins. Then the Quran says this clot is placed into a safe place. Well, what was obvious for millennia that this would be the uterus. But the Quran even manages to get this little detail wrong. In Surah 39.6, we read how Allah creates humans from a single person, sends down eight cattle in pairs, and makes embryos in three veils of darkness. These veils have been interpreted as being the anterior abdominal wall, the uterine wall, and the amniochorionic membrane. Hmm. While I have a fairly good idea what the first two are, I could not find out what an amniochorionic whatever is. So I, prefer, I presume it refers to the amniotic sac. If I'm mistaken, please correct me. I, I, I have not found this word. Well, and if, however, they're talking about the amniotic membrane, they're missing the outer chorionic membrane, which would constitute a fourth veil. So either way is wrong. What any woman who has had children will know is that a fetus reacts to sound and light. So what is it with the darkness? I presume this was lifted from the Talmud, where in Nida, Folio 31a, it mentions the embryo passing through three chambers. And you can see the link downstairs. We get, the, we get to the Alaka stage, where the meaning has been changed over time to ultimately end up as a leech-like structure. This is what I consider the outright dishonest part. I have no idea where the ever-present picture of the leech and the embryo comes from that you find on Islamic sites. I really tried and could not find a single picture even remotely resembling this. I can't show that many because I only found a few royalty-free pictures of leeches. But do these resemble an embryo? Not even close, come on. An embryo also is attached by an umbilical cord and does not cling directly to the uterus wall. It also does not suck anything out of any tissue, so I have no idea where this leech-like can realistically come from. Now this is a 27-day-old embryo. Does this resemble an embryo or a leech or a clot of blood? You be the judge. The, the next stage is the mudga stage, which should occur after 80 days. But by this time, the embryonic phase is well over, as the fetus is essentially fully formed. Apart from creative pictures on Islamic sites, I have not found a single representation of an embryo looking like a chewed piece of anything. If I look at pictures of an embryo that is over 80 days old, it is a sheer impossibility to chew anything this large. Staying with only the Quranic description, it is still wrong, as at no stage does an embryo or the later fetus resemble anything chewed. And finally, the Quran describes how the embryo's bones get covered with flesh. As any student of biology will know, the bones are calcified after the muscles pick up their work, so this obvious error causes a considerable amount of headache for Muslims in general, and not only miracle seekers for a change. There are too many attempts at rectifying this for me to mention here, so I'll only touch on the most common one, the temporal misunderstanding. In 2314 it says, then we made the seed a clot, then we made the clot a lump of flesh, then we made in the lump of flesh bones, then we clothed the bones with flesh, then we caused it to grow into another creation, so blessed be Allah, the best of the creators. Um, creators? How many? W was this a human comment? Anyway, what some apologetics argue is that this actually refers to cartilaginous precursors to bone, as the then is not to be understood as a temporal sequence, but a reference to a new event. 
To make it easier to see, I will use the transliteration. So we can see that the we made formed creator, the Kalakna, appears three times, once for Nutfa, once for Mudga, and once for Itaman. The last ones are preceded by Fa, which means then. So it can't possibly mean cartilage, good roof, in the muscles. What is also clear is that the second part of this ayah is saying then we clothe the bones with flesh. So first bone, then flesh. Here I've prepared a short table with a comparison between Islamic and real embryology. On the left we see what the Islamic texts say and on the right what we know today. So we see that all aspects of this version of creation are wrong and do not reflect reality. The timing is wrong as is the actual description. So I'm sorry, the Quran fails to pass the three truth test. It is not scientifically accurate and is not a miracle. There are perfectly normal explanations regarding the level of knowledge in the Quran. There are words that could mean something but are not the scientifically accurate terms. The description does not reflect reality at all. Sorry. So let's look at the interesting part. Where does all this confusion actually come from? And here we get to the third type of sources, the external sources of this miracle claim. First and foremost, we hear one name all the time, Dr. Keith L. Moore, the former anatomist at the University of Toronto. A professor and not a scientist at all, as apart from writing some books, he did not publish any notable papers or do any research himself. We get references to a 30-year-old video and a book where Moore obviously praises the Quran and blows the trumpet of Quran miracle seekers. Now, why would a university professor do this? When researching this, I constantly came across one name, Sheikh Abdul Majid al-Zindani. He studied in Egypt, returned to Yemen in 1970, and has been active in the Muslim Brotherhood, the Commission on Scientific Science in the Quran and Sunnah, and Islamic Affairs in Saudi Arabia. Some 30 years ago, he organized several conferences for Western scientists and paid handsome fees, plus some impressive perks, all tricking academics not scientists, just academics, to say something nice about the Quran. Most of them retracted these statements later, but the damage was done. This is all public knowledge available on the net. Just search for Daniel Golden from the Wall Street Journal, for example. Uh, I've got the link downstairs. I even have an email by Professor Kroner, who regrets his statement, which he comments today, whatever you find on these sites, I surely never said as it is quoted now. What some Muslims are not aware of is that Professor Moore has two very different versions of his book, The Developing Human for Different Markets. In the 8th edition from 2007 I have here, published by Saunders, there are no references to the Quran or any hadiths except if I turn to the chapter called Historical Gleanings, where we can see he and Monsieur Persaud refer to the Quran as medieval myth, along with Aristotle, Galen and the Talmud. However, when we turn to his Islamic version, which is only av available in Islamic libraries and institutions and 50 pages shorter, we see a totally different picture. This version is also called The Developing Human, albeit with Islamic editions, something all Islamic pages forget to mention. If we go down the to the description, we see it is published in Saudi Arabia. And even though the author is still Keith L. Moore, it says here that it is the third edition without a date and is superbly updated by our Sheikh Abdul Mayid Azindani and other so-called scientists to provide the required references to the Quran and the Ahadith. And who do we find on this acknowledgements list? Sheikh Osama bin Laden. Just coincidence, I suppose. As they say in Peru, Oni Swaki Maripons. Unfortunately, I was able to verify with 100% certainty whether Mr. Azindani and whether Mr. Al Zindani are one and the same person, even though I suspect they are. If we turn to a page in this Islamic version, we get entire pages filled with a pertinent Quran ayat, as well as the hadith covering a specific section. Now, this dishonest practice has only one purpose to mislead Muslims who are brought up to accept or obey and not to question. Now, I've lived in this and I remember very well what it was like. It was not Moore, but Azindani and his team that came up with the re retranslation of Alaka as the clinging leech, because the clot of blood was too obviously wrong. In his later books, Moore even refers to Joseph Needham's book, History of Embryology, where he dismisses the Quran's ayat as merely a 7th century echo 
of Aristotle and the Ayurveda. This shows that the external sources are manipulated and not trustworthy. Conclusion I have shown that the claim for a miracle in the Quran regarding embryology is unfounded. I have shown that the terminology used in the Quran does not use correct and scientific words. I have also shown that the description of embryology in the Quran does not reflect the knowledge we have today and that the sources used to substantiate these claims are deliberately falsified to mislead, most of all, Muslims. P.S. A word of caution. I do not think that a believer has a reason to doubt their belief, as this is merely a critique of the scientific miracle claim and not the teachings of the Quran. Thank you for your time and interest.